Hello and welcome to another Smart ER News. So today we're going to look at three things as usual. One, things you should look out for when buying a smart car, especially a used one. Two, smart car clubs around the world. And three, as usual, everything good and bad in the world of smart car modification. But first, this. So welcome back and today we're going to look at again as I've said three things so the first thing we're going to look at is things you can look out for things to make your purchase of your next smart car um, a lot more safe nothing's ever infallible there's always going to be hidden things that even the best mechanics in the world will overlook but here's a few of my pointers uh, that you could look out for when going to look to buy your first used smart car. Now, in particular, I've got a lot of experience, as you know, about the Smart 451, but this could pretty much lend itself to most cars. So the first thing is when you're looking at the adverts, um, I, uh, in the UK there's a massive company called Auto Trader. Um, if you do your, your due diligence, have a look at the companies, do a little bit of research, um, I tend to buy from a company. Yes, it's going to be a bit more expensive than buying from a private individual, but you do have that peace of mind of the ability to take it back if there's something faulty. There's normally a warranty that comes with it. So that, that's the first thing I would look for, is look for a company and see if they've got any reviews. Um, when you go to see the vehicle, so look at the paperwork. So the paperwork here in the UK, you'll have a document which is a V5 or a logbook as it's commonly known. That states uh, a number of things, a registration, when it was made, um, it tells you how many owners it's had. It tells you quite a few things such as the colour in case it's been changed. And um, it also has things like the engine number on there and the VIN number. So here in the UK, ringing as it was known as, where you would take a, a stolen car and imprint, imprint it with the identity of a, a smashed up car and uh, basically sell it on and that doesn't happen so much it still, still does happen but it doesn't happen as much but i understand in the states and that is still something quite important so the logbook will also tell you how many keepers it's had as i think i've, I think I've mentioned um, that's a good indicator so if you think about it if a car is really a good car you shouldn't really have that many owners if you see a logbook or you see an ownership document which says it's had 10, 12, 15 owners, there's something not right there. Um, so, for example, if we look at, say, um, let's take my car, for example, which is a 2008 Smart 451, it's only had four owners. So what's that, 10 years, four owners? That's not bad. And I've had it for around about five or six years now. So I know everything that's gone on with that. Um, also in the paperwork as well, you should have documents like the service manual or the service record as well. Um, that's where the dealers will or, or a service uh, company will um, do the oil changes, do the regular service interval changes and they'll stamp the book. It normally puts the mileage in there as well. So that's another way of verifying the mileage as advertised and as it shows on the odometer in the car's clocks is actually the same as what it should be. Because obviously if you look at the documentation and the service history says it was at 20,000 miles when really it's at 50,000 miles, there's something not quite right there. Um, there's another document here in the UK called an MOT certificate. Uh, the Ministry of Transport document is effectively a safe way of a vehicle over three years of age. Uh, it has to then go an annual test. Now these tests are they're not to prove that the car is absolutely perfect, but it's roadworthy and fit for use on the Queen's highways. So what I mean by that is it checks the brakes, it checks the lights, it checks um, things like steering bushes, it checks things like rubbers that connect all those elements together to make sure that they're tight and safe so they're not going to fall off. You check tyres, it checks brake pad depth, um, it looks at things like safety belts, it also checks emissions, so the, the carbon dioxide emissions that it gives off. So it's, it's quite comprehensive. Now here's a great tip, now this is a really good tip. Not a lot of people know, here in the UK, I'm not sure about the States, but here in the UK, you can go on to the website, which is a .gov, .gov .uk. Go into Google, I'll put a link in the description below. You can type in MOT check of a vehicle .gov. 
and it'll take you straight to the to the UK government website. What this will do, you can type in the registration of the vehicle that you're looking to buy, and then it will tell you a number of things. It'll tell you um, if it has a current MOT, which means it's in roadworthy condition, so it's sort of being maintained. But it'll also tell you the history. It'll tell you the history of pretty much every MOT it's ever had. And it tells you if it's passed or if it's failed. Now, if it's passed, we know that that is really great news because the customer or the person that owns that car has taken the time to make sure it's serviced properly. It's had brakes done. It's had oil changes done, it's had general bushes and maintenance done, it's changed the lights, it's changed the tyres, it's changed the linkages when it needs to be done, not because it's failed an MOT check. That shows that person cares about that car. However, if you get a vehicle which shows, I don't know, your first MOT it's failed because of this, then the next MOT it's failed, then the next MOT it's failed, that's telling you that that person did not care about that car, they just ran it into the ground. Or they really weren't cared about what it drove like. Okay, so that's pretty much paperwork covered. Um, one second, I'm just going to check my notes. Okay. Yes, the next one then is damage. So this might seem pretty obvious, uh, damage on a car. So let's all be realistic. How many times have we gone to look at a car and we've all haggled, we've used a little bit of damage to say, oh, there's a nick there, there's a bit of paint there, or there's a bit of a scratch on the wheel there. Day-to-day -day wear and tear will happen on a used car. You can try and use it as a bargaining tool, that's fine. But more importantly, for the purposes of this video, it's all about what you use those little bits of information when you do a little overall check of the vehicle, what it can tell you and how you can use that to understand if it's a good vehicle or not. So, for example, if it's a small car like this one, which tends to go for... In the UK, a lot of newer drivers, younger drivers, city drivers, pay particular attention to the wheels and the tyres. Why? Because what will happen is when it gets curbed, so that means when you ram it up against the curb and it damages the alloys, it can crack them, which is quite expensive. You, know, you can pick up a used steel wheel for a smart, which looks very odd if you've got all, oil, uh, all alloy wheels. You can pick up a, a used one for like 25, 35 pounds or about $50. Um, an alloy wheel, you're looking probably about 100 to 150, depending on which one you've got. So it can be quite expensive. But again, it tells you how considerate, how caring, how thoughtful they were with that car. If they couldn't give a damn about how they parked it, then they sure as hell ain't going to give a damn about how they looked after it. So if you rock up to a car and it says, oh, it's in great condition, but you see curbed wheels, um, I would tend to just walk away. They don't care about it. They've just been using it as a mode of transport, which is fine. But they don't care about it so they're not going to care about the outside you can amount to a hill of beans they ain't going to care what's on the inside so in terms of maintenance it's not going to be that reliable and i wouldn't trust it i would just walk away you can also have a look at the tires as well you know are the tires of a decent tread depth so here in the uk i think it's uh, um, 1.6 millimeter tread depth i may be wrong i hope not check below if i'm wrong give me some links, give me some feedback in the comment section we'll have a look have a look at the tyres. So again, if you look across the narrowest part of the tyre, so you've got the wheel there, just turn it on its side, so you're looking at tread across the tyre. Have a little look. Is the wear even? Uh, or is it bold on one side and uh, sort of more uh, un unused or untainted on the other? Again, that could be overinflated tyres, underinflated tyres. It could be something wrong with the suspension where, again, it's had that curbing. Because every time you bash into the uh, the curbs, it's going to put due stress on the uh, on the connections, on the wishbone, etc. So I, I probably would avoid those like the plague. Um, other elements as well. So damage. Pay close attention. It's all very nice to rock up to a really nice looking clean car. And you go, oh, it's excited. I'm going to buy a new car. Wait, slow down, always take an extra pair of eyes with you. If you know somebody that's good with cars, for example, take those with you as well. Because while you're looking at how pretty, pretty it looks and look on the inside, you may miss, you may miss some things which are expensive. Now, this is more important if you're buying from a private seller, a non-franchise dealer, because they have a duty of care to you here in the UK that they have to sell you a vehicle which is in roadworthy condition. Um, if you're buying private, it's buyer beware. So particular things to look out for on the smart. Um, again, we've already talked about it. So look at the wheels because um, they're quite expensive. 
What you can do as well, if they are the alloy wheels, you can tend to look through and you can see the brake discs. Put your finger in, obviously make sure the car's cold and it hasn't been driving around. Put your finger through the front brake, uh, the, the front alloy wheel in between the spokes or the slots and you'll see the big silver disc, the brake disc. Put your finger on it and run your finger up it. And if you find at the end of that disc, so from the circumference and you work your way out to the end of that disc, if there's a lip, if there's a big lip, that means the brake discs might be changing. If you're not competent and you don't feel comfortable doing it, that's going to cost you an easy 200, 250 pounds. Because if you change the rotors, you're going to change the disc pads. Uh, and if you're not com competent or comfortable, I'm yet to do a video on that, thankfully, um, that's going to cost you money. So that's one thing to look for. Other things that people forget about, glass. Glass in a vehicle is very expensive. Front windscreen, have a really good look. Now, I got caught out, but I've been lucky on this one. So from new, I didn't realize it until a few months after I'd left uh, the dealership with this car. In the night, in the night time, I can see there's a hairline fracture pretty much just in line with my eyesight. But it's, I think it's been repaired or it's a manufacturing fault because it's been like that, as I say, for about five plus years. But have a look for stone chips, have a look for cracks, have a look for um, little telltale signs of uh, damage on the edge of the windscreen. Because if it goes there, again, if you don't have windscreen cover, which in itself are going to pay like fifty pounds excess, or what's that seventy five, seventy dollars excess? Um, you're looking at a new windscreen could be as much as three hundred pounds, four hundred dollars. A lot of money, a lot of money. Um, again, while we're talking about glass lenses, etc., look at the headlamps. Look at any fog lamps. Um, make sure that there's no cracks in those. Again, in the UK, that's an MOT fail, so we've got to make sure that they work properly. Um, also, when we're looking at, when we're talking about illumination, when we're in the cabin and we've got the vehicle on, have a look on the dashboard, see if there are any lights on there which don't look like you've seen them before. So in particular, there's a big warning triangle in the center of the dashboard of the, the second CV, Smart 451, for example. I think it's in the 450 as well. But that big yellow triangle with an exclamation mark in it, that means there's something not right. So um, you want to get a mechanic to have a look at it if you're interested and you think it's a bargain or take along a code reader. I, I have done a small video on the code readers you can get and there's a link there as well. And that, that will give you a code. You can type it into Google, smart 451, error code, type it in and then it tells you what it is. It could be something simple as it just needs a new sensor. It could be that um, there's a cylinder which has got a bad compression, which is pretty bad. But, but again, look for lights that shouldn't be there. Um, if there's a brake light on as well, that could mean the brake pads or the brake shoes at the back are worn. Um, it could be the ABS sensor is on its way as well. So just look out for lights. Effectively, when you turn the engine on, if the car is in the daytime, they're really, unless, the, unless it's the, the handbrake um, uh, icon, there should be no other idiot lights, for example. <laughs> I think that's what they call them, idiot lights. There should be no idiot lights on the dashboard as well. Um, what else? What else? What else? So in terms of damage, that, that's pretty much it, apart from the obvious like panel damage. Now, panels, fortunately, on this car are quite, um, quite readily available. There are loads around on eBay, on Amazon, in breakers yards. They're not that expensive. I've, I've got a crack in the rear bumper when my daughter reversed into a car. I know, how can you do that for such a small car? But uh, I've never repaired it, but I can find it for like £50, but I've just never got around to doing it. So there's another video uh, to be done somewhere in the future. So as, as far as I'm concerned, that's pretty much the golden rules in terms of looking for cars. Now, in particular on the smart car, there's a few areas I would pay, pay particular attention to. So when you go for a drive, um, always test drive it. Um, make sure the brakes have enough feel, make sure they are progressive, make sure when you put your foot on the brake it gives you a bit of bite. Um, make sure the hill the hill start assist works. So that is if the vehicle is on an incline and you go to pull away, you have your foot on the foot brake, you release the handbrake and then as soon as you take your foot off the foot brake it holds the car there for about a second to give you a chance to get your car, your foot sorry, from the brake pedal onto the accelerator pedal. So you go from there, it still hold, and then go. Make sure that still works. I have a particular problem, I've been banging on around about it for a while now, is the reverse as well. Take the smart car for a decent 
run. Take it for at least five, six miles. Um, if they don't want to do it, walk away. If they say you can't, walk away. Because trust me, it's a pain in the backside. I've been living with it for on and off for about four years. And it is a known issue with a lot of the four or five ones. Um, I've just recently looked at replacing the car. Watch this space. There should be a new addition to the family and Smart ER pretty soon. But a new actuator, which is the piece of mechanics which manually changes the gearbox for you. Um, you can buy them anywhere from £225 to £460, so $300 to $550. Um, plus then you've got to fit it and line it up, so you're looking at least another £100, £150 to get it installed on a ramp. So you're looking at a lot of money, and, and to be honest, my car, I think, as it is now, with the reversing issue is probably only worth around about a thousand twelve hundred pounds so it's not really economically viable because when it's in perfect condition at a dealer we're looking about two thousand two hundred pounds or what's that about two thousand eight hundred dollars is it worth it probably not so watch this space there may be a new vehicle coming soon when you're doing your checks on your, your smart car purchase purchase as well have a look at my videos um there's loads there show you how to do it but how to get into the engine bay now, a lot of dealers, I've been seeing a few cars recently, and they don't even have a clue where the blimmin' engine is. Um, so when they see me dive into the inspection service area at the front of the car, they just look at you as if they go, okay, this guy knows what he's doing. And when they look at the back, then they just go, what is he doing? He, I, I don't have a clue. There's an engine in the back. They just get dumbfounded. So do a little bit of research. Learn how to get into the engine bay. It is a bit of a faff, um, but it's worth it. Now, this can apply to a number of cars. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a smart car. When you get into the back of the car, take the engine bay lid off and put it to one side. Prop it up, and again, have a good look around inside the engine bay. Now, um, good things to look for is a good clean engine bay, but that could be just cleaned, like I've done in my video I've just done now, how to clean your engine bay. Um, that could just be clean, so okay. But if it's clean, great. Um, it gives you a better chance to have a look at things. Now, have a look. You can see some of the belts in there. So you can see things like the alternator belt and also the um, air conditioning uh, belt as well. Now, have a look at the belts. Now, the belts should not be shiny. They should be sort of like um, a used car tire black, not shiny, just sort of rubbery, if that makes any sense. Sort of a matte black. If they're shiny, if it looks like, um, you know, those those sweatpants, those jog pants you used to have that you'd, you'd go to school with and you'd slide on the school floors and they go all shiny. If it looks like that, then they need changing. So be, pay close attention to those. Um, have a little look as well. See if there's any bits of um, taped up electrics. That is a big no-no. So in the engine bay, there is nothing like that in a Smart for two. Nothing. All the connectors are clean, open, or they are all covered up. Um, with shrink wrap. So you, if you see anything like that, again, walk away. There's telltale signs there. It's not worth it. Um, final one. This one applies to uh, all cars, really. Take the oil filler cap off and have a look at it. Now, inside the, the top of the filler cap, have a look if it's clean. You can just take a rag with you, take a tissue with you, just wipe the inside. It should be sort of golden syrupy. It should be sort of like marmalade in colour if it's fresh oil. So if, it, if it's being described as it's just had a service, that's the colour it should be. If it's black, black, dirty black, you know, really deep, dark, sort of space black, then it hasn't been changed. But what you do want to pay attention for is anything that looks like, you hear it said a lot, white mayonnaise. If it looks white and creamy and fluffy, big no-no, big trouble. Say your uh, thank yous and pleases and say thanks for your time, but just get out of there as quick as your little legs will carry you because that engine is on its way out. Okay. Um, there was another thing as well. Uh, there was another thing as well. Trust your instincts. This is why it's important to have another person with you. If you go around that car and you get really excited and you get drawn into it and you think, oh yeah, I can see this. And if it's the nice one with the sat nav and the voice activated telephone and you've got the little gauges and it all smells like new car and it's all shiny and it looks pretty. But you've seen a couple of things, but you're still thinking it looks nice. Look at your, look at your person you brought with you. Go to one side. 
do all the checks we've talked about. If it doesn't feel right, walk away. Trust your instincts. So the next thing we're going to look at, it's going to be pretty much, most of it's going to be up there um, and, and down here in the description, really. But I've been really, really, I know I touched on it on the last show, but I've been really impressed at the amount of smart car clubs there are in the world. So I just wanted to literally mention a few. So I get a lot of views from all around the world, all around Russia, we get them from Belarus, we get them from Italy, Greece, and um, obviously the UK, the USA, all around the world. Um, I just want to give a bit of a shout out to these guys because if we can keep the smart car community growing and keep it engaged, then everyone benefits. The fun spreads and people tend to then start to dispel the myths that smart cars really aren't real cars because we all know they are if you've got one. So the first one is Smart Car Thailand. Um, they have some awesome cars, a lot of modifications. Um, really active on Instagram. So again, check the links below, click on the Instagram links, uh, add them, follow them, and just have a look at some awesome, awesome shots on it and the, the photography is stunning. So the next one, we'll go with hmm, Smart Brabus Club Italy. So, then, <laughs> <laughs> the clues in the title. So again, this is an, an, an Italian club, um, but they're all Brabus ranges of the smart car. So you've got the Roadster, you've got the 450, the 451 as well, and you've got some 453. So again, quite active. Oh, some gorgeous photography, some beautiful, beautiful cars. It is Smart Car Belarus. Uh, smart Car Belarus. Don't know much about them. I've seen them commenting and like on Instagram a lot. And again, really active. Like only a small, a small club, but it's from uh, from Great Oaks, Little Acorns Grow, and again, it's just spreading the word across the whole of Europe and indeed the world that just how great smart cars are. Uh, what do we go for them. Let's go to Smart Cars Florida. So Smart Cars Florida, um, there's a gentleman there who's really, really active. Messages me a lot. I've been invited there next year when I go and visit my son in the states. Um, I'm going to go down to Daytona, uh, Daytona Beach, and I'm just going to have a blast. And we're going to meet up. Uh, we're going to hopefully have a bit of a, a bit of a uh, maybe maybe do a video there. That'd be great. That'd be cool. That'd be something uh, so so amazing. I'm really excited about that. Um, I've had a, <clears throat> a couple of emails from him as well, and he's been really engaging. And his his smart car club online is growing. So again, check out the comments below. I will put a link to his Facebook page. If you're in Florida, check this guy out. There's so many active members in there. He puts some really useful information, local contacts as well for how you can uh, get repairs, how you can get spares, people that do certain um, modifications as well. And um, they're always doing meets. So I, I think that's that's fantastic. And the last but not least is the Invicta Smart Car Club. Now the Invicta Smart Car Club, um, it's probably the one that I... I remember the most, particularly from a military background, uh, Invictus, Invicta. Um, they have some stunning meets. They've got a really, really good professional looking web page as well. Yes, it's below. Um, check them out. So if you're in the UK, have a little look because they are really active. They do lots of meets, a lot of members. Um, they take a lot of pride. They've got so, so, so much help, so much experience in terms of if you've got you know a lot more um technical problems than, than I can deal with and I think they've even got access to a garage as well and they, they, check them out they are amazing really really good so um, yeah that that's some of the, the many 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 smart car clubs that uh, I've noticed in the last god three or four months of just adding Instagram and uh, really starting to drill down into this for the news show for you guys so here we are the last part of the show but it's always my favorite it's the good the bad and the ugly of smart car modifications. So today, let's go straight in with the good. Wow, I absolutely love the Roadsters. I absolutely adore them. And the Brabus Roadster is got to be the most gorgeous one ever. Why did they ever not continue that? What a stunning piece of kit. The colors just, oh, the black ones I think look really mean and moody. But the wheels, the way that they fill the arches, 
the profile on them, and the way that some of these guys really look after and detail them is amazing. They put gullwing doors on them, um, just a slight modification here and there. They just make them look wow, and they are absolutely, positively my favorite smart vehicle. I wish they would bring that back. So that's the good. Now the bad, yuck. Now, I'm sorry if you like it, but I think this is called the, the Glitterball smart car. Um, it is damn ugly. Um, it, I think it was done to commemorate some sort of function, but it's the wheel rims look too big, so I reckon they would fly off. I, I, it's pretty much got to be some sort of a, an event car because you can't drive that thing. Imagine if you're driving and, and it's coming towards you and you shine your lights on it, it's just going to dazzle you. Ridiculous, but um, I'm sure they've put a lot of effort into it and the finish looks quite good, but I really don't like that. Um, what do you think? Put your, put your comments in, the, in the, the section below and let me know, would you drive that? Uh, I watch all the girls now and they go, yeah, 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 I'd love her, I'd love it. Okay. So then we got the ugly. I wouldn't say so ugly, I would just say weird. And, and literally, just before I started putting this together to come out today and do this in the in the little studio I've got, um, I, I, I did a double take. It, it pretty much is a, a big truck rig that's being tacked onto the back of a smart, I think it's a 450 by the look of it, definitely a 451 or a 450. But it's got that big aerodynamic, <coughs> excuse me, that big aerodynamic um, diffuser you get on some of the big American sort of Peterbilt trucks. And then you've got two stacks of, of um, exhaust going up either side. And I'm just thinking, oh my God, what is that all about? But um, if you know why, or if you know the person that owns it, please get them to get in touch. I'm, I'm intrigued. That, that makes no sense to me whatsoever. But uh, hey, each to his own. But again, so... There we are, that's the good, the bad and the ugly in smart car modifications. Um, pretty much that's it for this week. Um, if you've got any comments, questions, please keep your uh, your personal cars coming through. Send me in the email below, have a little look, click on that, send me some of your files of your photos of your own cars. I'm putting together um, a special video just to, to show off your cars and your pride and joy. Uh, if you've got any comments, anything you'd like me to do, so that coming up, I've got uh, how to replace the rear wiper. I've still got to do the diagnostic tool, the walkthrough, how to use that. Um, I've got a bit of a problem on this Smart 451 I've got now where the ABS sensor comes on all the time. Um, so there's another video coming up there. Um, there should be a new car in the family within the next week or so. Ooh. But uh, watch this space. It might be a convertible. Mm. Wanted a convertible. Um, but other than that, thanks very much for joining me. Thanks ever so much as usual for your uh, for your participation. Please keep the emails and the Facebook comments and the Instagram coming. Um, leave a comment below. Please, it's very important. Thank you so much to everyone that's been subscribing. Um, subscribe, share, like, leave your comments. You tell me, and if I can do it, I'll do it. Have a great day and uh, stay smart.